So welcome to the Compounding Center Connections, where we talk about different health conditions with our partnered practitioners. I'm your host, Jay Gill, a compounding pharmacist from the Compounding Center in Leesburg, Virginia. At the Compounding Center, we collaborate with practitioners, create custom medications to help our patients get better. So in this episode, we have Dr. Scott McMahon from the Whole Wealth Healthcare in Roswell, New Mexico. So Dr. McMahon, thank you for joining us on this episode. And today we're gonna to be talking about chronic inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS, and the use of vasoactive intestinal peptide nasal spray. So by a way of introduction, Dr. McMahon uh, and I met a couple of years ago at a Lyme conference and he has spoken uh, on this topic at, at a number of medical meetings. He's written three books and authored or co-authored 10 peer-reviewed published articles. So he is an expert on this topic. Uh, before we begin, Dr. McMahon, could you please introduce yourself and your practice? <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Uh, I am Scott McMahon, doctor. Uh, I've been doing SIRS medicine for like 13 years now. I've seen around 2,000 patients. Uh, I see my practice name is Whole World Healthcare. I also have a nurse practitioner named uh, Dr. Callie Kundamal with me. She's actually a doctorate in nursing practice. Very smart. She's known about SIRS for a long time. Uh, we are uh, busy, but always taking new patients. And uh, we do a considerable amount of legal work. And I am just honored to be on your podcast today, Jay. Well, thank you for joining us. And before we dive into it, just a basic disclaimer here for everyone. The information discussed today is just for informational purposes only, not for diagnosis or treatment. So, uh, so Dr. McMahon, could you tell us... Um, what the basics of SIRS and how, like, I think of it as more, it's, uh, you know, uh, related to mold toxicity or biotoxin illness. So could you uh, tell us a little bit of what is SIRS? So SIRS is a relatively new illness that was first described by Dr. Richie Shoemaker in 1996. So, so it's only 27 years old. Um, but it is, and so a lot of physicians don't know about this yet, but it is uh, an illness that is usually contracted after chronic exposure to uh, the indoors of what we call water damaged buildings or, you know, houses or workplaces or schools that have allowed water through what are called water intrusions, like broken pipes or a leaky roof or whatnot, they have allowed water to get to building materials that have paper on them, like insulation, sheetrock. Mm -hmm. And what science has told us is if that water gets to these building materials within 24 to 48 hours, they start to, to grow molds, bacteria, actinobacteria at a, an astonishing rate. So each mold or bacteria that maybe... Maybe the, the mold was in a spore form, so it's really not doing anything. Then it becomes metabolically active. It starts making toxins, and it will multiply itself by a factor of thousands. So same with the bacteria, same with the actinobacteria. So you get this, this uh, either dampness or increased microbial growth, and some of these products get into the air, and you breathe them, and particularly in people that have certain genetic predispositions, which we can test for in a blood test, this will cause damage to the innate immune system. And I should stop there for a second. When I was in medical school, they taught me almost nothing about the innate immune system because we didn't know anything about the innate immune system. Most of the study in immunology was about uh, the adaptive immune system, which is where they make antibodies. And you've got a whole field of medicine called rheumatology that studies just that. But this illness isn't there. It's not an allergic reaction. It doesn't have anything to do with antibodies. It's, a, it's in the innate immune system. And since most people my age didn't learn very much about it, most people my age don't know anything about this illness. It's pretty scary, isn't it? It sure is. I mean, it's... Uh... Yeah, you, you, uh, and it gives you pause and concern, you know? So, uh, exactly. well, so uh, if I could continue, so, yeah. so, so when the innate immune system gets broken, 
which happens in every SERS patient. The, we see regulatory uh, chemicals, and I'll stop there for a second for your, for your followers. You know, a regulatory chemical in the body is something that regulates a particular system so that it works properly. Sometimes it needs to work high, sometimes it needs to work low, and you have chemicals in your body that regulate. Well, you have two chemicals in your body that regulate your innate immune system to make sure it doesn't stay too high too long. One of those is called MSH or alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. The other is called VIP, basal active intestinal peptide, which oh. as it happens is the topic you know, that we're discussing today. So invariably in my patients, either MSH, VIP, or both of these are broken and are at very low levels. And because they're at such low levels, they are no longer able to, to take an elevated, activated immune system, innate immune system, and bring it back down to normal. So what does that mean? Well, let's say you, you were to get a cold, Jay. Okay? When you got a cold, it could be a flu, it could be you know, regular rhinovirus, it could be COVID, any kind of viral infection or even a bacterial infection. If you got that, your innate immune system is going to ramp up and cause your body to make these chemicals called cytokines. That's C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E-S. These cytokines then go throughout the body and try and destroy all the invaders, whether they're viral or bacterial or fungal or whatever, they try and destroy those. And if you look at somebody who has, we'll say the flu, they get, you know, achy and fever and chills and headachy and their muscles hurt and their joints might hurt. Those symptoms are actually caused by the cytokines. They're not so much caused directly by the flu virus. They're caused by the body's immune response to the cytokines. Hmm. And so, so you start to ramp these chemicals up, this, this production of your chemicals because your immune system is getting active, trying to destroy that influenza virus. Once you get rid of the virus, you need to come back down to normal because this whole time you're elevated, you are creating inflammation in your body. And it's the VIP and the MSH that bring everything back down to normal at the appropriate time. And if you don't have adequate amounts of VIP or MSH, you are unable to bring those elevated levels of cytokines back down to normal. You just keep overproducing and you keep getting the symptoms of you know the, the illness that you are having and that's what chronic inflammatory response syndrome is is this overactive innate immune system that continues to be activated because you continue to breathe uh, air that has microbes in it or fragments of old dead microbes. You continue to breathe them in. And every time you do, you are stimulating the innate immune system to ramp up and you don't have adequate MSH or VIP to bring it down. And to make it even worse, you know, if this were a cat allergy, all you'd have to do is get out of the bad building and you should be fine. But it's not like a cat allergy. It has nothing to do with allergies. It takes MSH and VIP to bring that innate immune system back down to normal. And if you don't have adequate amounts, even if you leave the bad building, you'll still continue to have symptoms. And that's why you have to use the Shoemaker protocol to get better. And so that in more than a paragraph is what SIRS is. In some ways, it's kind of complicated. It requires a knowledge of, of understanding what the immune system is. But to put it in COVID terms, it's like a low level cytokine storm happening 24 seven, 365. You know, and that's exactly, that's exactly what I was thinking when you were explaining it. And I like the way you simplified it and explained the whole, how it's happening. Now, um, uh, can you talk about some of those uh, signs and symptoms? I know you mentioned about it, but, uh, and one other follow-up question to that is, can VIP or MSH levels be checked or is that just uh, kind of um, uh, you automatically go into it that the, uh, the levels are too low? Yes, there's a blood test for VIP and for MSH. If you order it through Quest or, or LabCorp, uh, the value uh, that you're looking for for MSH is between 35 and 81. 
If you order, and then VIP is also available in a blood test. If you okay. order LabCorp, they use Futhan, which is not our favorite preservative to use, but they use Futhan. The normal range is less than 650. If you order it from Quest, uh, Quest decided a few years back that they didn't want to send it to National Jewish anymore because it required dry ice, which I'm sure is an additional expense to them. Um, and so in a lot of places, if they run it, you'll get a, a result that's less than 50, which is indeterminate because their normal range before that was 23 to 63. So uh, indeterminate isn't very helpful to us. So I usually recommend people get it through LabCorp. Got it. So uh, going back to signs and symptoms, any uh, when you see a patient, uh, what do you mostly kind of uh, most of the common signs and symptoms that makes you suspect this is happening that you come across? So when looking at adults, probably 95 to 96 percent of our, our adults have chronic fatigue. And it usually starts out intermittently and then it just is progressive and it gets worse and worse till it becomes daily and okay. overwhelming. Uh, uh, probably close to 90% of our patients have chronic headaches um, and they can be of different kinds. They can be tension, they can be migraine, they can be chronic daily headaches uh, but and cluster headaches too, uh, but they'll have headaches. And if they already had headaches before their exposures, they'll have an exacerbation. They'll have more and more and more severe headaches that take uh, larger amounts of, of stronger medicines to get better. Uh, another common thing that we see is uh, stomach aches. Uh, so you may not know this, Jay, or you might, but the number one reason why people see their primary care physician in the United States is because of chronic stomach pains. And there's, a, there's kind of a workup that we do in both pediatrics and in adult medicine that look at you know, different organic causes of stomach aches. And, and then the last step is like a colonoscopy and an endoscopy to look at, you know, what's going on in there. And people with SIRS almost all the time will have a completely negative workup. Everything will be normal. And so what the, the doctor who doesn't know about SIRS will say is, oh, well, this is functional. Functional means like it's in your head that you actually feel the pain, but it's not because there's anything going wrong with you. But what I found, what I found looking at children, and I, I tell you, you know, I'm a pediatrician by trade and by training, I should say, you know, when I was in residency, what they taught me was that the kids who have, you know, no discernible cause that this is, you know, stress, or this is, uh, they're trying to get a primary or secondary game. Primary game would be like, I didn't study for the test. I don't want to go to school today. Yeah. The secondary <laughs> game would be more subtle. It would be like, um, there's a bully, you know, and he takes my lunch money and I really don't want to go to school ever, you know, but it's more subconscious. And so you, so the idea is that your brain creates this stomach problem. But when I had an active pediatric practice, I'd see these kids and I do the normal GI workup and find everything was normal. And then I did the surge workup on them. And I found that about 90% of these kids who didn't have one of the organic causes had SIRS. But, sure. but if you don't know about SIRS, you don't look for it. And so then you have to come up with some other reason why they have it. So it must be in their head. But I'm telling you, it's not in their head. It's, it's, in, their, it's in their immune system. And if you look for it, you'll find it. And then when we treated these kids, about 90% of them either had complete resolution of their abdominal pains and, uh, or they had a significantly decreased amount. And I found the same thing for chronic headaches in children. I bet you didn't know this because this is kind of an esoteric fact, but 17% of children between the ages of four and 18 in the United States have chronic headaches. That's 10 million wow. children in the United States. And nobody knows what causes them. But I could tell you the exact same thing. I, I worked them up for SIRS, found about 90% of them had SIRS. And when we treated them, almost, almost all got much better or completely resolved their headaches. So, I mean, this is a breakthrough that yeah. almost nobody knows about. 
<laughs> well, uh, this kind of leads us into my next question is, can you talk about some treatment options that you have as in your toolbox, essentially, to uh, treat patients with SIRS? I can, but before I do that, I wanted to mention a few more symptoms. Okay. okay. SIRS is a multi-system illness. We, in Western medicine, we divide the body into systems, like the respiratory system has to do with the lungs and breathing and the nose. You know, the cardiovascular system is the heart and the blood vessels and whatnot. And the nervous system is the brain and, and all the nerves and the spinal cord and things like that. So what you'll see with SIRS in children who are 11 or older is it will always be multi-system. Usually it's four systems or more, which is really unusual because children, wow. you know, that's the healthiest time of our life. And as a pediatrician, multi-system illness appears to be really unusual in children. But you'll see not only the three things that I already mentioned, but you'll see like muscle pains that are often characterized as growing pains. You'll see neuropathic pains like, like uh, shooting pains or burning pains or like stabbing kind of pains like an ice pick. Uh, you'll see uh, chronic congestion, stuffiness, chronic sinusitis, shortness of breath, going up one flight of stairs and, and like kids or, or adults just totally out of breath, regardless of their level of conditioning. We'll see the stomach pains, chronic diarrhea, uh, numbness and tingling, cognitive issues, huge. At least 90% of my patients have one or more of the six cognitive issues that we look at. Loss of memory, inattention, frequently misdiagnosed as, as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in small children. Uh, we see all sorts of weird things like behavioral changes and whatnot. Uh, frequent urination is another really common one. Probably 80 to 85% of my patients are peeing, you know, the normal is three to four times a day and none at night until you're 45. And almost all my patients, at least five out of six, are peeing eight times a day, 10 times a day, 20, 25 wow. times a day. Can you imagine going to the bathroom literally every hour, <laughs> getting up three, four, five times a night to go to the bathroom? It happens. And, and there's a perfectly reasonable explanation why it happens. But if you don't know the right blood test to draw and you don't order it, you won't find it. And you'll think, oh, well, maybe you're getting diabetes or, or something else that causes polyuria. But again, if you don't know what you're looking for, you will never find this illness. So those are the symptoms. And then you asked me a question about treatments. I stick pretty much to the, to the shoemaker protocol. Okay. And the shoemaker protocol is a pyramid or, you know, to me, it really looks like a triangle, but he calls it the pyramid and he, he created it. So he's probably right. Um, the shoemaker protocol starts with number one, you have to get out of your bad environment, which means if you're, if you're at work, you know, that's the problem. You either need to move to a different building or a different part of, of the building, or, or maybe for some people, they have to get a new job. You know, if it's a school teacher, maybe they can go into a different wing. You know, I mean, there, there are ways yeah. around it. Um, or it has to be remediated. So if it's your house and you have control over it, you have to remediate it. And you have to remediate it properly. And that's not so easy because a lot of the mold inspectors and a lot of the mold remediators aren't aware of this illness either. They just think that mold can cause allergies and other kind of nuisance symptoms. So... And there's a lot of variability amongst uh, the remediators out there. And there are certain protocols that are that we're developing at SERS X that will, that if standardized will really help protect the SERS patients and, and do a better job. Uh, but that's step one. Step two is to take a binder. And I'm, I'm a little passionate about this. There are many people who are treating this illness around the country who use kind of what I call wimpy binders. Okay. Okay. Like, you know, I don't know if I should, they're just not as strong. So like GI detox or uh, clays or bentonite clay, zeolite clay, uh, charcoal. I think they work. I, okay. think they, I think they take a lot longer to work than I, I, I actually see people all the time 
that it took them two to three years to get better, taking their wimpy binder. <laughs> uh, and I use I use exclusively I use cholestyramine and I use Wellcall. Okay. Because they're much stronger. And I know that there's a chart that's going around that you know shows like like this particular uh, binder works well for this particular mycotoxin and whatnot. The problem with that chart is nobody knows how it was created. There's no data behind it. You know, we don't know how that was determined. Was it determined by urinary mycotoxin testing or we don't know, but it certainly is contrary to my experience because my experience is using cholestyramine is people are much better in two to three months. Oh, wow. Okay. Two to three years. And I think if you, if most people knew that, that they would, prefer to take the, the stronger binder. I, I mean, that's just my thought. Now, not everybody yeah. can, can tolerate cholesterol. Not everybody can tolerate well or cholesterol. So I have some alternate ways to work people up to those things. But to, to put all your patients on, um, on, on, you know, let's say bentonite clay or a combination yeah. of clay or cholesterol once a day, I think that that's actually doing them a disservice. And so I'm hoping people who watch this will try using col col uh, cholestyramine or will at least contact me and I'll, I'll talk them through it and, and say, this is how you do it. And yes, some people are sensitive and you do have to try other alternative methods to work them up to it, but they will get much better if you start with cholestyramine. So that's step two. And then, you know, there's checking for Marcons and then there's a, a group of abnormal lab tests that we look at, and if those continue to be abnormal after you uh, after you finished your binder, then we treat those specifically one at a time. And then the final step is VIP. Okay. VIP. I think that's v top today. I keep saying <laughs> that word, don't I? And and VIP. I'll just real quick here. I mentioned there's three primary groups I use VIP for. One is people who have chemical sensitivities. One is people who didn't have, uh, who didn't get at least 70 to 90% improvement while they were using the cholestyramine. And I mean, overall okay. 70 to 90% improvement is what I'm expecting within two to three months. So people who didn't get that, we'll try VIP and see if we can't get them to that 70 to 90%. And then the third group is the rare person who didn't have a response to adequate doses of cholestyramine. There, there are some other areas that I use it, but but those are the primary ones. So, so for those patients that have not gotten better, you've moved down the protocol, talk to us about, okay, how does at this point, using the nasal spray, uh, how did, oh, you know, we know it uh, brings the levels down, but like, how does it help them or are there any side effects to watch out for, or are there patients that are not good candidates for it? So unpublished data uh, using the, the Genie test that Dr. Shoemaker and doc, Dr. Jimmy Ryan created, okay. unpublished data from that shows that some people will have one of their VIP receptors will be basically turned off, the VIP R1 receptor. And so in those patients using a low level so instead of the normal dose, which is uh, it's 500 micrograms per milliliter, instead of using that, we use one that's 100 times less diluted, or I'll say one to 100. You know, okay. Solution. We'll use that for a month or so, and that will um, turn that VIPR1 receptor on. So if I have somebody who, you know, we've gone through cholestyramine or well call, and they haven't really made much improvement after two or three months, then that's the next thing that I'm thinking about is maybe your VIPR1 receptor is off. And so sometimes we'll get a genie, sometimes we'll get, uh, uh, we'll just try them on the one to 100 VIP uh, intranasal spray, and sometimes we'll do both. And the idea is that we wanna turn that on and then all of a sudden they seem to be responsive to therapy. Okay. And how long does that take and how long uh, would a person start to see benefits from it uh, on average? So in that situation, 
uh, probably within a month or so, you'll start to see changes and they'll start having some gradual improvements. Remember, this is a gradual disease, Jay. It doesn't, it doesn't usually, there are, there are a few exceptions, but it doesn't usually just come on and hit you overnight. It usually ta it takes, you know, months or maybe even years of a initial exposure to get you to the point where your VIP and your MSH levels break and you can't bring your immune system back down to normal. And during that time, you know, if you do leave your bad building, you probably will have resolution or improvement of your symptoms. But at some point you reach a point where everything breaks and, and if you've been going like this, now you go like this. And wow. Dr. Shoemaker talked about this 13, 14, 15 years ago, called it sicker quicker. You don't ever want to get to sicker quicker. Uh, and because before it took long periods of time to to feel terrible you know for long periods of exposure now it, it might take five minutes or in some people 15 seconds or 15 minutes and and they'll be sick for several days because they've they've reached that breaking point and there's no going back from the breaking point there's management but there's no going back Gotcha. So, you know, um, at the compounding center, we most recently just about three or four months ago started making the uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide nasal spray. And one of the, uh, you know, one of the most common questions, hey, how long am I going to stay on it? Am I on it for a lifetime? So that's the reason I uh, wanted to ask that. Um, are there any side effects that one should look out for when they started or are on it? So I'll start with side effects and then I'll go to duration. And if I skip duration, let me know. Okay. Side effects are, are minimal. I mean, I, at this point, I've used this on several hundred patients. And I, I've had one patient that I had to stop VIP altogether. And they had a history of chronic pancreatitis before we ever put them on, on VIP. Okay. Dr. Shoemaker's had one patient like that also who also had chronic pancreatitis. That's the only person that I've ever had to take off because of side effects. Only one, yeah. out of hundreds. Uh, but what we tell the crowd is uh, you can get headaches, transient first week or two. Um, some people will have what's called a dysthymic reaction. So if we were to imagine Jay happy and bubbly and you know his normal self, and then imagine Jay who is despondent and depressed and whatnot, mm. dysthymic is somewhere in between. Okay. And okay, so that's a transient kind of thing we can see for like a week or two, and then it usually goes away. Those are the primary side effects. What we do tell people is if you start to get stomach aches or you start vomiting, you need to let us know because those could be signs of pancreatitis. And, but as of yet, I've never seen pancreatitis in any patient other than those two that I described who already had some unknown thing going on with their pancreas that caused them to have recurrent inflammation there. Gotcha. So dosing depends on what protocol I'm using. And you and I, we talked about this briefly. There are several different protocols that I use. So the standard one, and this is for people that don't have multiple chemical sensitivities. They either don't have a neuroquant test or their neuroquant doesn't show, you know, caudate nucleus atrophy or multinuclear atrophy. So we're just talking about the standard patient. I usually put them on the regular strength uh, VIP, the 500 per milliliter. I'll put them on one spray four times a day, and I'll do that for a month. And then I'll talk to them uh, about, you know, how they're doing. We'll have a you know, brief conversation. Are you having any side effects? Are you having any improvements? And based on that conversation, what I'll usually try is to find the optimal dose for them. So I don't know what the optimal dose is for you, Jay, and it might be different for me if we had SIRS, I'm sure we don't. Um, but, but for our patients, some people will do very well with one spray four times a day. Some people are using six or seven sprays four times oh, a day. Wow. And they actually become very functional at those higher doses, but they didn't get any effect from the lower doses. So I'll spend a little time uh, figuring that out. And the way I do that is um, for someone who's completed that first month, and by the way, I've checked their lipase to make sure, you know, just as a theoretical that there's nothing going on with the pancreas. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try them on two sprays 
four times a day for two weeks. And then three sprays four times a day for two weeks. And I'll meet back with them again in a month and say, so where did you feel best? Did you feel best on the one, on the two, or on the three? And if they say on the one, then we just drop their dose to one. And as they say on the two, then we continue on the two. If they say the three, then I say, well, let's try four and five. And we do the same process for two weeks uh, of each. And then we get together in a month. And which one is best? And so I'm trying to find what the very best um, uh, protocol for them is. Okay. And once I find that, then I stay on it for four to six months. And, okay. and, and by that time, usually these people will, if, I think what's happened is their immune system is balanced out because they weren't having enough VIP and MSH, but now we've given them some and boom, it starts to come down back to normal and, and they are feeling great, but not only are they feeling great, but if, if before, you know, they would go into a, a water damage building for five minutes and they'd be sick for several days, it's like they now have a buffer and, mm. and they can take those incidental hits. They can't get a 40 hour a week job in a multi building, but they can, they can take those incidental hits and not be sick. And so it really starts to open their life up to them again. And so, and then at four to six months, we'll meet again, we'll see how they're doing. And if they've achieved that, then I just start weaning them off pretty quickly. And usually they're able to maintain those benefits for a long time. Not everybody can wean completely off. But let's say you're doing four sprays four times a day, that 16 sprays. Oftentimes, if we can't wean them off, we can wean them down to one or two sprays a day. So much less, much less expensive and still maintain, you know, doing really well. And I probably would see them back six months later and, and try to wean again and get them off completely. So that's the standard person. If you had abnormalities on your neuroclon, We've already published data that showed that if you did three sprays four times a day in the, uh, in the published journal, it says for four to eight months. In the unpublished data, we find that eight to 12 months at a minimum, 12 months is probably the cutoff point. So if we did those three sprays four times a day or more for a year, then uh, we would get optimal improvement in what's going on in your brain. And what we found was actually that using VIP caused people whose caudate nucleuses and their other multinuclear atrophy either stopped or started reversing. We didn't get them to come back to control levels, but, but they started going back in the other direction, which means that like brain is regrowing. And that is a phenomenal result. Doc, Dr. McMahon, uh, how often do you test for the VIP uh, test or the MSH test. And then the uh, I have another follow-up question is, could you also explain to the general public, what is Neuroquan? So uh, I check VIP and MSH on every new patient. And okay. I know that when they're low, they don't change very quickly, unfortunately. Unlike some of the other markers we look at, they don't change quickly. So I check it either every six months or once a year on my Okay. Patient. Uh, Neuroquant is a what's called an advanced technique uh, volumetric brain MRI. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, so by volumetric, what that means is it actually measures the volumes of individual discrete structures inside your brain. Now, if you were to get a standard MRI, the neuroradiologist could do that but he would have to count all the voxels, which is the MRI term for pixels in our cameras. They would count every voxel on every slice, and there's usually like 60 slices, and then they'd have to add it up and do a bunch of math and come out with it. And what's reported is it takes about 100 hours to do one. <laughs> but with, with NeuroQuant, they can do it in 10 minutes. 10 minutes of computer time can do all of that. And the people that created NeuroQuant, Cortex Labs, have developed an algorithm where the computer can differentiate these different uh, structures in your brain. And then it goes through and it counts the voxels for you and then puts them all together and then determines what your total brain volume is and then divides each structure by that and gives you a unitless dimensionless uh, percentage 
of the size of that structure on both the left-hand side of your brain and the right-hand side of your brain. And then you can use that to compare to normal values to see if somebody is either swollen up or big or if they're um, small. Dr. Shoemaker and, and Dr. Ryan and another, and I have published three papers looking at this. In 2014, we came up with the pattern that we saw in patients who had, um, there's a pattern of swelling and, and, uh, and atrophy in patients who have had uh, uh, SIRS as a result of water damage buildings. There's a second paper that we came out that reinforced that more data and also looked and, and developed a completely different algorithm for people that had uh, structural brain damage as a result of SIRS from Lyme disease. They're completely different patterns, completely different areas of the brain that are affected. And then in the, and we, yeah, and then the third, I'm sorry, in the second paper, we also showed that if you follow Dr. Shoemaker's protocol all the way up to that just to the next to the last step, not using VIP. But if you followed it all the way up, then that pattern of swollen areas, like the cortical gray that covers your brain and the forebrain parenchyma, they're like tennis ball size areas of white matter in the front of your brain. It's what distinguishes us from say monkeys, that those levels would come back to control level. Basically it's fixed. Um, but what we saw was that the caudate nucleus and other atrophy and other atrophy nuclei didn't come back to normal. And then the third study showed that if you use VIP, that either the, the, uh, the shrinking stopped or it started coming back toward normal. So pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now you had mentioned that you had several or a couple of different protocols. So it makes me wonder what other conditions are you using the VIP nasal spray for? Well, it's, it's, VIP is a potent vasodilator. And so it's being used in, uh, and tested in people who had COVID. It's, yeah. being, it's being evaluated for people who have uh, ED, erectile dysfunction. Oh, really? Because, okay. Because the problem there is, is often vascular. Yeah. And, and it's actually, uh, it's a cousin of uh, Viagra and Cialis. The VIP. Okay. Yeah, so it's being used that. And I just learned the other day that Viagra is being used in newborns who have pulmonary hypertension. So yeah, you know, Dr. Shoemaker has used this in people with pulmonary hypertension also and had some tremendous successes in unpublished data. Wow. Well, yes. um, I mean, there's a whole lot of great information you've just shared with us. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how could someone reach out to you after listening to this podcast and had more questions and wanted to get in touch with you. You bet. Can I, can I go through one more protocol before I do that? Yeah, sure. Definitely. This is good okay. stuff. So please. So this is for people who have multiple chemical sensitivities. People who, have, uh -huh. you know, who get triggered by uh, perfumes, colognes, uh, detergents, uh, fabric softeners, dryer sheets, all these unnatural fragrances that, that are around us. For those people, some of them have no problem taking medicine. Some of them have a great deal of difficulty taking medicine. Uh, for those who have difficulty taking medicine, I found that using a one to a hundred solution or sometimes even a one to 10,000 solution that they can have significant improvement in their ability to tolerate the other medicines in the protocol by starting them there or trying some things and when you see they're not working, starting them there. And then, and then while I'm doing that and going up to Shoemaker Protocol, I also work up their VIP dose on the side so that they get to the same place about the same time. When they're ready for, for uh, VIP at full strength, I've already kind of titrated them up to that. But the duration of time that people with multiple chemical sensitivities will use VIP is longer than any of the other protocols. What we found is that uh, once they hit the, the standard dose of the, you know, the normal dilution, uh, probably it takes about two years, but after that they can have a much improvement in their chemical sensitivities, which 
really opens up their world to them, allows them to go into more places and, and yeah. things like that. So, so that's phenomenal, but it, it takes a lot of time. And, and I'll tell you, every chemical sensitivity patient I've ever seen had SIRS first. And Dr. Shoemaker is the one who actually told me that after I'd seen it in about 20. He said, yeah, I've seen 200. And they all do. And I'd say it's about 10% of SIRS patients have the chemical sensitivities. And about 10% of those also have problems with EMFs and electrohypersensitivity syndrome or electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome. So I know that that's a controversial illness, but I've seen enough patients now, and I don't think they're making it up, uh, that I, I believe it does exist and there's just not enough data on it yet. So that little bit. Now, if you wanna contact me or my office, <laughs> uh, our, our phone number at the office is 575-627-5571. That's 575-627-5571. Or you can reach us at WWHC, that's for Whole World Healthcare, WWHC info at wholeworldhealthcare.com. Well, what I'm going to do is make sure I put all this uh, in the show notes, uh, your contact information and your website address so that people can reach out to you. And once again, I'd say thank you very much for sharing this information with us way in more in depth than I'd expected. And I appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us or tuning into the Compounding Center Connections podcast. We hope you found this information presented today to be helpful. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to me at j at compoundingcenter.com. And subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast channel, The Compounding Center Connections. And stay tuned for future episodes. Thank you, Dr. McMahon. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Jay. And thank you for inviting me.